Hey there, this is Clay with ModernLove.Life, and this is Relationship Inner Game. Now, in today's episode, I want to talk about the, the issue of emotional unavailability in relationships and in dating. It seems to me that emotional unavailability is actually something that is at all-time highs right now in our society. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that that maybe go a little bit beyond the scope of this particular show, such as social media or smartphones and things of that nature. But emotional unavailability is really something big that, that you really need to address and you really need to be aware of when it comes to the dating and relationship world, okay? And this is all within the context of what we talked about in our first episode on the big picture for really finding love, okay? And if you understand that, you'll understand that you need to accept somebody as the way that you found them. You have to accept them 100% the way that you found them, which means that if you find somebody and they are emotionally unavailable, you have to accept that they are likely to stay emotionally unavailable. There's nothing you can do that's going to magically get them to suddenly become emotionally available for you and want to commit to you or anything like that, okay? Yes, people can and do change, absolutely, but it's not necessarily going to change on your timeline, okay? It's not gonna, you're not gonna be able to change them necessarily you know, within the next month or within the next year or within the next decade even, okay? Yes, maybe you, his icy little heart might melt and he might suddenly want to commit to you and only you, but what if it takes 20 years? Or what if she finally decides she's willing to break up with her boyfriend to be in a relationship with you, but not for another five years, 15 years, 25 years? So you have to accept the person as you found them. Okay, now there are a couple exceptions to this, such as, for example, if somebody is going through a breakup and they were emotionally available before the breakup, then the breakup is an event that's happening and they become emotionally unavailable, as all people do during breakups. And then afterwards, they are likely to become emotionally available again once they've processed the breakup, once they have dealt with their emotions and all of that, right? However, if somebody was emotionally unavailable before the breakup, through the relationship and then they go through a breakup and they're still emotionally unavailable, the chances of them eventually opening up and becoming emotionally available in the near term future are pretty slim because they have this constant pattern of being emotionally unavailable. And so as you found them is how they are likely to stay. You have to accept that, okay? Again, there are exceptions to this such as the breakup thing I just described. but. If you find somebody and they are emotionally unavailable, that is to say maybe they're in a relationship with somebody else and they're, you know, you're the other woman or you're the other man on the side, they're probably not going to leave the other person to be with you. Or if, you know, they they, they come on hot and they want to commit to you and all that stuff and they talk a good game, but then when it comes time to actually make the commitment real, they back off, they disappear, they ghost you or something like that then, you know, yeah, there's probably some degree of emotional unavailability going on right there. And what exactly is all of this emotional unavailability? Well, if you really look at it, it is a aversion towards actually experiencing what is happening in the present moment. Instead of having a relationship with the person that we're actually with in the moment, we want to instead compare something to the past, compare it to the future, compare it to maybe something we saw on a movie or something we saw on TV or some relationship that we heard about that we always thought would be really nice or something like that, right? And if you're constantly comparing something or someone to something or someone else, you are in effect not really in a relationship with that person. So for example, if I was to go out and date a woman and um, I was going to constantly compare her to my ex, I would be emotionally unavailable to her. I would be emotionally unavailable to her because I'm not really having a, a relationship with her. I'm having a relationship with someone who is not my ex. Does that make sense? Or I'm, 
I'm not able to be fully present with her because I'm just too busy, you know, tallying up all the ways that she's different from my ex, all the, way that, all the ways that she's better than my ex, to the point where I'm not actually seeing the person that I'm actually out on the date with. I'm just dating somebody who's different from my ex. Or the same could be said about relationships, right? Oh, well, this relationship is so much better than my last relationship. This relationship looks like that one I saw on TV. This relationship is, is just like the one my mom and dad had. Things like that. Or even worse, you know, having some, being with somebody just because you think it's going to mean something about you. Like, oh, if I, if I go out on a date with this guy, then finally my mom will stop badgering me about settling down and getting married. Or if I get a girl that attractive to go out on a date with me, or if I sleep with a girl that attractive, then suddenly that means that I'm, I'm, I'm a real man and all my buddies are gonna give me high fives or something, right? And, and, and damn Jenny from, from, from high school who rejected me for prom, she was wrong this whole time. I really am a desirable person. Because you're not emotionally available to have that connection with the attractive woman or with the guy that you're out on a date with. You're too busy caught in this story in your head about, oh, she's a perfect 10, or, oh, if I, if I finally get him to be my boyfriend, uh, you know, my family will approve and give me lots of validation or something like that. And it's sad, but there's lots of people that live their lives this entire way, you know? There are guys out there who fancy themselves pickup artists who, unfortunately, uh, have, have become completely emotionally unavailable, you know? Interacting with an attractive woman isn't so much about the interaction with the attractive woman, but it's about the story that they can tell themselves about, I seduced this woman. I'm finally a real man because, you know, perfect tens are, are going out with me, are sleeping with me, and all of this stuff. And that's not really a real emotional connection that you're having with her. You're not being emotionally available with her. And, you know, that's fine if you just want to sleep around. But if you ever want to have a real relationship, a real connection, a real something substantial, you're going to have to be able to interact with the person that's actually there. Get to know who's actually there. Not just make it mean something about, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm a real man because I've slept with a hundred women. Or I'm, I, I, I'm finally content because I got some guy to want to be my boyfriend, or I got some guy to marry me, or I got my mom to stop badgering me about grandkids, or something like that, right? And if you can start to get rid of these stories, and instead just be present, completely present, with the person that you're with, without it necessarily going anywhere, without it leading to sex, or maybe it does lead to sex, or without it leading to a commitment, or maybe it does lead to a commitment, and simply just being with that person. That's what emotional availability looks like. Now, we are in a culture, in a world, where we often are judged by external things. If we're married, if we have kids, if someone attractive is dating us, if someone attractive is sleeping with us, if multiple attractive people are dating or sleeping with us. We, we, we get this message, this reinforcement, that this means something about us. And our culture is kind of fueling this emotional unavailability. And so you're going to have to move against it, to fight against it, to, to, uh, to unprogram yourself from this external validation trap if you really want to actually have emotional availability. And if you actually want to be in a relationship with somebody who is emotionally available. So, if you do find that you are in a relationship or dating somebody or attracted to somebody who is emotionally unavailable and you want to be in an emotionally available relationship, again, what's our primary rule? How you find them is how they are likely to stay. So if they're emotionally unavailable, then they're probably always going to be that way. And you have to make a hard choice. Is that okay? Are you okay? to be involved with somebody who is emotionally unavailable? Are you okay to be in a relationship with somebody who is emotionally unavailable? If you are okay with that, then that's fine, go ahead. But if you're not okay with that, if you want emotional availability, then you have to make the hard choice and let that person go to create space in your life so that you can welcome in somebody who is emotionally available for you. 
Now again, like I said before, there are some exceptions to this, such as you know somebody who's emotionally available goes through a short term of emotional unavailability, such as a breakup or maybe a parent dying or some sort of crisis of some sort in their life, and then they go on to be emotionally available again. You know, I, I had this experience in my own life. I was emotionally unavailable, or I was emotionally available rather, um, and then I went into graduate school, which was very difficult, very demanding. Um, that's actually when I met my wife, Mika, and uh, I was actually a little bit emotionally unavailable because I was working on my thesis and all of that stuff. It was a lot of work. I wasn't able to be there in the way that she wanted to and the way that I wanted to be there for her. But it was temporary, and after I finished school, I was able to become emotionally available again. And so um, it, it, it's not always this black or white thing, but you have to look at somebody's long-term history to see if they're going to be emotionally available or emotionally unavailable if you're in one of those circumstances, okay? Go back and say, okay, you're going through a breakup right now, but, you know, what was it like when you were together before that breakup? What was it like before that? I'll have these discussions. You know, maybe it's not something you talk about right out of the gate on the first date, but at some point, if you are serious about maybe wanting to see where this goes with this person, have these conversations with them. Get to know them so that you can make an informed choice about if this person is emotionally unavailable or emotionally available, if this is the kind of person that you want to be in a relationship with, or if they're not. And then once you start to get a clear picture, make your choice. Anyway, I hope this has helped you out understanding emotional availability and emotional unavailability. And with that being said, let's go ahead and get started with our questions for this week. Okay, our first question comes in from Vixen. Vixen says, I just had a question about what I can do because G is talking to me briefly. I wished him a happy Easter, and he answered. However, I try bringing up casually just seeing him with other mutual friends, and he doesn't reply. I said this after he told me he wasn't sure what he was doing that weekend. Quote, Oh well, let me know if you want. S is going Friday and Saturday, so I was going to go uh, one of those days, if you want to join. End quote. That was last week, about a theater show we are both going to, and I tried Snapchatting him the next day to no response either. I am always initiating. I don't know if he is just nervous about seeing me or something. We saw each other kind of by coincidence last time I visited his area, and it wasn't horrible. Maybe he just doesn't want to plan anything. I don't know. I was thinking of trying to strike up another conversation and then ask him about it, but I don't know how I should approach it. Make it in context? Just text it to him? He won't answer phone calls. Here's what I came up with. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Like, just say, quote, Hey, I know we've been talking a little bit, but whenever I bring up catching up or doing anything, you don't seem to want to talk. Does it make you uncomfortable or something? Thanks. Okay, so in the situations like this where you are having a conversation with your ex and uh, they, they seem to be apprehensive about meeting up with you in person, it sometimes can be because they um, just are feeling a little bit anxious about meeting up with you. And in situations like that, um, and, you know, just given the, the context that you have described to me here, I don't think it would be a bad idea if you were to send him a text message like the one that you had drafted out here where you said, hey, I know we've been talking a little bit, uh, but whenever I bring up catching up or doing something, you don't seem to want to talk. Does it make you uncomfortable? Something like that. It's not a bad idea, and I think it can help you to get to understand maybe a little bit more about where he is coming from on a personal level. Um, you know, if you look at what could happen, on one hand, he might respond to you and tell you what's going on, in which case you can know how to address that or know how to deal with that. And on the other hand, um, if he doesn't respond to that, then, you know, there's probably some sort of uh, degree of reactance or some degree of uh, resistance on his part when it comes to interacting with you. Okay, this is the kind of uh, vulnerability that I think could be very helpful when it comes to creating that kind of connection and really understanding uh, what's going on. And it, it, it also really helps to, to be willing to say 
uh, and speak the elephant in the room in a way that that definitely can um, uh, foster a connection between the two of you where you're, where you're not, you know, blaming him or making him wrong or something like that, okay? And, um, you know, you did mention this idea that maybe he doesn't want to plan something and uh, that, he, that you're always the one initiating. And again, when it does come to women who want to get back together with their ex-boyfriend, um, you have to understand that this is not a dating kind of circumstance, okay? You can't expect him to do the initiating maybe as if he was dating you, okay? You're the one that wants to get back together with him. You have to change his mind about breaking up with you. Therefore, you have to accept the fact that you are going to be doing most of the initiating. You also have to accept the fact that um, if he has a degree of reactance towards you, if he has a degree of resistance towards being close to you, he is not going to go through the process of planning a date. He's not going to sit down and say, hey, what could I do? Where could I take Vixen? What would be a great rest? restaurant we could go to, uh, well, I, I, what, what time should we go and should I go and pick her up and all that stuff. You know, that's not going to be something that's going to enter into his mind. So if you can make the choice easy for him by, uh, you know, doing it for him, you know, essentially saying, hey, me and some friends are going to get together at seven o'clock at, you know, XYZ place, you should come. Something as simple as that would really be helpful and make saying yes on his part a whole lot easier. So um, overall, I wouldn't say that the tech text message that you uh, wrote up is a bad idea. I think it's, I think it can actually help to bring a little bit more understanding to what's going on between you and him and help you, uh, you know, get some, get some momentum behind you in terms of which way you're going to go rather than sitting here in this state of limbo for a while. Okay. Our next question is from Kay. It seems that I've been doing progress with my ex according to the quality of our conversations, even though I haven't applied the ANC. Just some days I managed not to speak to her and spoke less than before when I was desperate. She talked about some handsome guys she saw, about a man who tried to flirt with her, which may be a possibility of trying to make me jealous. Besides, she praised me sometimes, both physically and for my competence and had the initiative to submit an artistic work to a project of mine, about which we discussed. Also, she called me a gentle name she invented, and she used to call me when we were in our relationship. Other thing is that she started to talk by her own about our past when I was just trying to say funny things. She remembered two great experiences together, but the majority were bad experiences to her. Every time it happened, I asked her to forgive me for my previous mistakes and tried to make sure I improved because of practices and studies I've been doing. Differently from before, when she had said she didn't need anybody, now she said she needs a person who has a certain characteristic, which I said I fit them. But she kept saying we had no affinities that I should look for another woman to make things right next time in another chat when she said I could correct mistakes in the next relationship. I said we will talk about this personally better, and she answered that when be back, this could be a huge progress because she would be admitting our personal meeting, and we are in different countries. And she asked me if I were seeing other girls. I said not. She suggested me that I should do that for fun. I said I wasn't that kind of person, but I would do if needed it. I asked her also if she was seeing somebody. She said not. What do you think about my ex and her stages? Not always she answers me, but she did that sometimes during our formal relationship. But often do. I'm struggle not to be anxious and insistent, not to look for her more than once a day. ANC would benefit us now, since things seem to feel good and fun. I'm trying to apply ARS in my daily life, looking for emotional connection. Okay, so if you ask me, it seems like she might be at the riding the dragon stage. It sounds like she has a lot of mixed emotions about how she feels about you, and she isn't sure uh, exactly how she feels, so she's giving you these hot and cold behaviors from one day to the next. There are times when she's very warm and doing things such as calling you by the, the, the pet name that, that, that she came up with you at some point and submitting works to some sort of artistic project that uh, you know, you're 
putting together, I'm assuming. Um, yet there's also times when she pulls away from you and talks about, you know, oh, well, in the next relationship, this could happen or whatever. Um, and so that's that's what's really going on with, with the riding the dragon stuff, is that your ex is having these mixed emotions. Now, sometimes this could also be characteristic of the crisis point. However, I'm, I'm not really getting that sense from your ex. The crisis point is characterized uh, where your ex is actively trying to discourage you because they do feel a strong level of uh, desire and a strong level of connection towards you, but they are afraid of making the actual choice about perhaps breaking up with somebody or perhaps... Uh, you know, telling all their friends and family that the two of you are getting back together or something along those lines. And so they might actively discourage you. Now, this could sometimes seem similar to riding the dragon because, uh, you know, you, you are getting this hot and cold. You are getting the warmth of connecting with them, but the cold of them discouraging you. However, this discouragement is going to feel different than them actively feeling confused, actively not knowing if they want to be together with you. Okay, so that's my assessment about where you might be with your ex, okay, Kay? And um, I, I also think that doing some active no contact could absolutely help you if you haven't done that yet, if you're still working on developing the advanced relational skills. But again, that's really a choice for you to make on your own and to feel into that situation and to know if that is the right decision for you. Okay, our next question is from Evie. I have been an ESP member for 16 months now, and in that time I have improved so much in the way that I interact with people. I used to be a very shy person, a natural introvert. I found it very difficult to relax and talk to people. Since starting ESP, I have improved in my conversations, and I have formed deeper connections than I could before. However, this weekend, when I stepped out of my comfort zone and did dancing with a bunch of girls that I didn't know, I found that my ability to create interactions that feel good is still quite limited. Although I could appear like an extrovert for the first hour, asking people questions, being open, making contributions to the discussion, feeling relaxed in conversation, I found that as time passed, I couldn't quite keep it up. Perhaps this was because more strangers kept being added to the mix. I began withdrawing back into my shell and, look my, and took myself out of the spotlight. Since you used to be shy yourself, would you be able to give me some tips on how I can improve my ability to stay present and ability to connect with people that I don't know? I can feel that the biggest problem I have is anxiety about being myself amongst people I don't know, especially if it's a lot of people. It is unfortunately not uh, a conscious choice to be anxious. When, what can I do to feel more confident and to get rid of this social anxiety that I still suffer from? Okay, so when we get into this whole question about shyness and introversion and all that, it's important to realize that there is a big difference between shyness and being an introvert. They are not the same thing. It's possible to be an outgoing introvert and it's possible to be a shy extrovert. Uh, what, what's happening with the whole introversion, extroversion thing is that's really just looking at whether you get your energy from spending time with other people or whether or not you get your energy from spending time generally by yourself or in, you know, small like one-on-one -on -one kind of interactions. And, you know, I'm, I'm personally an introvert myself, and the way that you've described it, it sounds like you're an introvert as well. You know, you can go into a social interaction, a party or something like that, and you can come in with high levels of energy, you know, assuming you probably spent time beforehand on your own. You know, you come in and you have high levels of energy. You can, you know, generally keep up with people. But as time goes on, you'll start to use up your energy and you'll start to feel depleted. And as that happens, you'll find it harder and harder and harder to do extroverted things. And you'll feel much more inclined to sort of withdrawal and do things that are a little bit more solitary, such as maybe step out for some fresh air or have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody or do something along those lines. 
If you are an extrovert, the exact opposite happens to you. You know, you can you can go into a social interaction and you start interacting with people and you start to absorb their energy, you start to take on their energy. And the more time that you spend in that sort of cir- circumstance, the more energized you feel, which allows you to, you know, keep partying on later and later on into the night, okay? However, there is an extra dimension to a lot of this, which is the whole shyness or social anxiety sort of thing. And really, shyness, it can come from a, a lot of different things, but, but oftentimes it's really a fear of how other people will perceive you, okay? It has nothing to do with where you get your energy from. You know, you could be afraid that other people will judge you in this way or that way, or other people will think that you're desperate, or other people will think that you're needy, or other people will think that you're stupid, or other people will think that you, uh, you know, said the wrong thing, or other people will think that you're brash. And that is that is basically your mind coming in to keep your actions in check. And sometimes this is a good thing. Sometimes you don't just want to say everything that's on your mind. Although, in my experience, generally, people would be a little bit better off if they did say the things that were on their mind, if they ju- just did take their foot off of the brake, so to speak, so that they could really express themselves in, in a real way and really allow themselves to, uh, you know, get some real feedback from other people about um, whether or not they like who you genuinely are when you're being yourself or whether they don't like who you genuine, genuinely are when you're being yourself. And it's true. I am an introvert and I did used to be shy. Um, I grew up very shy. I spent a lot of time being shy, and it wasn't until I was maybe about 25 or so when I actually overcame my shyness. Um, I I was basically at work, working on a very big project. Um, I was working probably about 70 or 80 hours a week because I was working on a different project as well, and I was was taking on a second project uh, to get some good experience in a sort of computer program system that, uh, that we were using. And so I was really burning myself out very, very, very ex- extensively. Um, you know, I'd come home just in time to get a couple hours of sleep, and then it would be back to work. And um, once all of these projects were wrapped up, it was kind of coincidentally our, our office holiday party, our office Christmas party. And so, um, you know, I was kind of sleep deprived, and all it took was a couple of drinks, and suddenly... Uh, all of my filters were gone. All of my shyness filters were gone. And uh, suddenly people were actually responding very positively to me. People actually liked spending time with me. People uh, were, were, were enjoying me. Women were flirting with me. Women were spending time with me. I was getting lots of great responses from some of the, you know, single women in the office. And that's when I realized that it was actually okay to be myself. It was actually okay to just express how I actually felt and that I didn't have to suppress it. I didn't have to try to be proper. I didn't have to try to have my act together or anything like that. I could just really express myself. And um, so, so if you're looking for a way to overcome social anxiety, one thing that can really help you is to practice being more vulnerable, is to practice uh, stepping out of your comfort zone and expressing yourself in ways where maybe you would typically hold yourself back. If it's uh, more of an introversion-extroversion thing, I, I'm afraid there's really not a whole lot I could tell you to do, um, aside from just really learn how to embrace whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. Just learn how to embrace that and learn how to deal with things appropriately. So, for example myself as an introvert, I know that that I need to, you know, show up big at the beginning because when it comes towards the end of the night, I'm going to run out of energy. And so I need to make it a good impression. And then as the evening goes on, I need to, you know, find like a, a, a small group of like one or two other people that I can be closer with and uh, connect with those people. Because if I'm stuck trying to do the whole extrovert card towards the end of the night, it's going to be really, really difficult for me. Um, whereas, you know, if you're if you're an extrovert, you could go the opposite way. You know, you could kind of warm up with some people, you know, a, a small group of safe people or something like that. And then um, as, you, as you start to get more comfortable, more social, you can move on to the larger group and, uh, you know, enjoy kind of more of, the, more of the, you know, surface level banter as the night goes on, okay? So I hope this helps uh, you understand more about shyness, more about social anxiety, and more about maybe pushing your comfort zone a little bit, okay? So I hope this helps you out, Evie, and please keep us updated on how things go moving forward. Okay, our next question is from Jay. 
Hi Clay, I have another question. How do I know whether I am emotionally unavailable? And how do I spot emotional availability in other people? Okay, so when it comes to you being emotionally unavailable, like I was talking about in the first segment of this recording, it, you really have to look at how you are relating to that other person. Are you relating to them as a reflection or a comparison to the past, to maybe some ideal, to some sort of um, concept or something that you maybe read about in a book or a movie or a TV show or something like that? Or um, are you are you really searching for perfection in another person or in a relationship? Are you uh, disqualifying people who aren't 100% perfect? Are you too busy comparing that other person to your ex, to maybe some connection that you used to have in the past, to some relationship that you used to have in the past, or anything else like that? Because as long as you're doing these sorts of things, you're unable to actually experience the present moment with that person. You're unable to actually be emotionally available to that person in the present moment. And so it's it's very important to learn to drop these stories, drop these comparisons, drop these things that keep us out of the present moment so that we can actually have meaningful, emotionally available connections with other people that we might be interested in perhaps having a romantic relationship with. The second part of your question is how can you spot emotional availability in other people? Well, basically, you are just noticing how they bring themselves to interactions. And, you know, once you actually start to get to know them a little bit better, you can start to learn more about, you know, how they see you or how they relate to other people in the past or something along those lines. You know, if somebody says something like, oh, well, you're not like other guys or you're not like other girls or something like that, that's a sign of emotional unavailability because that person is comparing you to other people, other you know, other people that maybe they've even dated, right? And that's not to say that if you're emotionally available, you're never going to compare the person that you're with to someone else. You know, there's still times when even I look at my wife and I'm like, oh, wow, you know, she she doesn't, you know, play the victim role and blame me for everything that's wrong in her life like my ex did or anything like that. But, but you know, that's not the main way that I relate to her. That's not the main way that I see her. But if you're with somebody who whose main way of interacting with you is like, oh, this is just like the kind of love that I've always wanted since I was, you know, a, a little girl or something like that, then that's a sign that that person is emotionally unavailable. If somebody says uh, something like, oh, you're just so much easier to talk to than my ex, that's a sign that that person is emotionally unavailable. And so what you want to do is you want to look for little things like this, okay? Uh, you know, don't don't just take like one little thing that somebody says is like, there you are, you're condemned. But, you know, look at that as evidence and kind of put it together with the other things that you know about that person, the other experiences that you had with that person so to start to create an overall picture so that you can get an idea about who that person is as a whole. So, Jay, I hope that helps you out. And please keep us updated if you have any other questions. Okay, and our next question is from Clyde. Clyde writes in and says, Hi, Clay. I'd like to ask you about how to empathize with people who are depressed, unmotivated, or simply going through troubling times. Oftentimes, such people just prefer to not reply to messages, avoid talking, and it's hard to have interactions that have them feel positive. If you bring happiness, it can make them feel isolated. And if you bring yourself to where they're at, the conversation is just going to feel sad. Specifically, the reason I'm asking is because Bonnie is going through some difficult times. I believe she is quitting her career soon and forced to confront that her life plans will change. Knowing her, I can see how this will leave her in a state of apathy. I've actually been getting such impressions since January, and now it's stronger. If I try to relate to myself uh, when I'm feeling that way, I just push people away too, and I hate it when others make me talk. However, if someone were to inspire me to feel better, I'd value that person a lot. Do you think it could be do you think I could be such a person for her? Thanks. Alright, Clyde, so 
When we talk in our courses, such as the X Solution program, such as Dating Bravely, such as Loving Boldly, about having positive emotional connections with people, um, oftentimes people will misinterpret that as meaning that it's, you know, happy, fun, fun time, and that it's just all about jokes and smiles and giggles and all of that stuff. But that's not what I mean when I talk about a positive emotional connection. What I'm actually talking about is a connection where both of you feel as if you can actually be real and open and honest with one another without having to put on an act or pretend to be cool or uh, play hard to get or play mind games with one another or anything like that. And um, uh, uh, in that respect, a positive emotional connection can actually be the two of you talking about sad things. It can be the two of you talking about um, you know, when your life goes off track from the way that you thought it would turn out or something along those lines. And when that happens, um, you can actually come closer together on an emotional level because you can relate to where that person is at. I think you might see where I'm going with this. You can relate to where that person is at and connect with them in that way. So in that respect, the relate and reward cycles that we talk about inside of our courses in the Advanced Relational Skills section are very useful. You know, you can go ahead and meet Bonnie where she's at. You can go ahead and, and, and relate to that, uh, you know, sadness or depression that she might be going through. You can maybe share a story about maybe a time that you felt the same way. And then you can start to um, talk about, you know, throwing a reward in that in that mix as well, too. Maybe saying something that, that you appreciate about her, such as you know, you really do seem to take your life seriously or something along those lines. And that can start to bring the two of you closer together. It can help her start to feel seen and it can help her to start to trust you a little bit more so that the two of you actually can start to strengthen your emotional bond with one another. Okay, so don't think that you have to always be stuck in the happy fun fun time trap or anything like that. Because again, you know, if if somebody just wanted to date somebody who was always happy, they'd just go out and date a circus clown. But uh, I'm guessing that circus clowns probably aren't very high on most people's list for dating, in which case... um, most people probably actually want to date a real person, a person with a fully fleshed out human experience uh, that feels the full spectrum of emotions from happiness, sadness, frustration, all of the things in between. Okay? So Clyde, I hope that helps you out and please keep us updated if you have any more questions moving forward. All right, so those have been our questions for this week's Relationship Inner Game Experience. This has been Clay with ModernLove.Life, and I hope that this has helped you improve your Relationship Inner Game. If you've liked this video, please go ahead and like and subscribe to the channel, and please go ahead and leave a comment down below. Anyway, I'll talk to you in our next video, and I'll talk to you next week during Relationship Inner Game.